what's unique about this is this is the, the, the testing company, Strata, sponsoring the clinical trial that is evaluating the, the, the pharma therapeutics. Usually, it's the pharma sponsoring the trial of their drug in their indications of interest. But, but we really see a, a turning of the tides where companies like Strata, with the data that we're amassing, the clinical outcomes compared with the molecular data, we're in a position to advance these new biomarker hypotheses, which is good for us because uh, it, 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 these trials advance and demonstrate the utility of our tests. Uh, but it's also good for pharma and, and, and good for patients to really optimize and maximize the use of the drugs we have. Welcome to the Personalized Medicine Podcast. This is the place where scientists, clinicians, and entrepreneurs discuss the progress of this rapidly developing field. I am your host, Alexander Yahensky. Let's start. Three, two, one, and we are live. Personalized Medicine Podcast is back again after a short break. In this episode, we come as close as it gets to what personalized medicine is really about. We will be talking about precision oncology and how genomics can help physicians determine the best possible treatment option for each individual cancer patient. And I'm not sure if it is possible to find a more knowledgeable and experienced person to cover this topic than our today's guest. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Dan Rhodes, the founder and CEO of Strata Oncology. Dan received his PhD in bioinformatics from the University of Michigan. After completing his degree, Dan co-founded Compendia Bioscience, a university spin-off that focused on developing genome data mining tools for oncology applications. Compendia was acquired by Life Technologies in 2016, with Dan serving as a VP overseeing oncology strategy, first at Life Technologies and later at Thermo Fisher. During his career, Dan co-authored more than 40 research papers and 10 patents in the field of cancer genomics. Dan's most recent venture is Strata, a precision oncology company focusing on leveraging state-of-the-art genomics tools for more efficient cancer diagnostics and treatment. Dan, thank you so much for accepting my invitation and welcome to the show. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Perfect. Great. Dan, I would like to start with your story. Perhaps you can tell our audience a bit about your background, what motivated you to um, start a career in bioinformatics, and your experience with Compendia Bioscience, and how this all uh, led you to founding Strata. Sure. Yeah, great question. So, so when I rewind back uh, a few years, a couple of key moments. So for, for me, one was uh, I was taking a molecular biology course uh, as an undergraduate, and we had a lecture on a new technology at the time called microarrays, uh, a technology that allowed one to survey the expression of all of the genes in uh, the yeast transcriptome at the time. Um, and, and I was, I was amazed. Um, and the reason I was amazed was because this was really kind of turning biology into uh, more of a mathematical or computational uh, science. And, and, you know, I'd always been strong at math and, and, and computers, uh, but, but had, had had this drive to uh, work in healthcare and, and to solve biology problems that could impact patients' lives. And so, so this notion that uh, you know, new technology at the time, microarrays, now next generation sequencing, is really you know, transforming uh, the study of disease into a data and an information science was just you know, so cool for me. Um, and and I, I sort of knew right then I, I would have to work um, in this field. And you know, a few short la- years later, that, that microarray technology began to be applied uh, in the cancer spectrum. And I knew I had to, I knew I had to jump in. Uh, I had a great year at a place called the Van Andel Institute uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, building microarrayers and and studying uh, kidney tumors and nasopharyngeal tumors. This is where I, I first began sort of applying my sort of math skills and coding skills to uh, study and understand uh, the cancer transcriptome. This this led me to 
pursue at first an MD PhD at the University of Michigan uh, with, with a belief that I would do both. I would I would see patients and, and I would be a scientist. Um, but what happened was, you know, I had a, a really uh, wonderful um, first couple of years of medical school and a wonderful experience as a, a graduate student studying bioinformatics. I worked with an incredible cancer genome physician scientist, Arul Chanayan, uh, at the University of Michigan. We, we, we did a lot of uh, great work uh, studying different types of tumors, uh, published a number of papers, and, and but also built uh, an incredible resource, uh, a cancer genome mining platform that we called Oncomine. So this was really the, my first foray into product development. We had a great team at Michigan um, that, that, that worked on this. And, and what happened was very interesting. Uh, pharma companies began taking uh, an interest in uh, our, our data platform, and, and uh, the university began licensing access to that platform. A light bulb sort of went off for me and um, realized that, hey, I like the idea of, of building tools and systems that help others you know, advance their work in, in studying and, and, and fighting cancer, and uh, decided uh, uh, to take a big leap and, and to leave sort of the security of medical school and a career trajectory as a physician scientist to go uh, build a company. And, and so I left uh, Michigan uh, after finishing my PhD to, uh, to build a Compendia Bioscience and, and had a really great run at Compendia. Uh, it was a wonderful opportunity for me to learn how to build a business, but also to go really deep into cancer genome data together with our pharmaceutical company partners and customers. Um, so, so this was just a, a wonderful experience really to learn about all of the different therapeutic mechanisms being studied by pharma, to understand and think about the biomarkers that uh, may be predictive of uh, response to those therapies. Uh, so it really started me in this uh, you know, precision oncology um, space that of course you know, led me to uh, life technologies via acquisition. Uh, had the, had the great opportunity to lead cancer sequencing at Life Technologies and really set our strategy from a cancer sequencing product perspective. What genes should we measure? How do we analyze those genes? How do we make those sequencing results useful and informative uh, to clinicians and researchers? Um, so that, that, was, that was another great experience. And, and, and that was the, the, the precursor to me you know, leaving Thermo Fisher uh, to start Strata Oncology. Um, and, and so, so, so that, that's the history there. It's been a very fun ride. I think the interesting thing looking back is I've really only worked on one thing in my professional career, you know, going back now more than 20 years, and that is sort of unlocking uh, 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 the cancer genome to better improve our understanding, uh, diagnosis, and treatment of, of cancer. Wonderful. Yeah, sounds like an amazing journey. And before we kind of jump into, into Strata, uh, I just want to ask one question. What kind of differences uh, have you experienced between working in your own startup company and then kind of transitioning and working on this pretty much the same idea, but in a larger organization and later at Life Technologies and Thermo? Yeah, great question. And these are two very different um, environments, both with... Um, their pros uh, and, and cons. Um, you know, I would say uh, in the startup world, uh, you, you really have the opportunity to wake up every morning and, and chart the best possible course uh, for, for the organization. You, you can be nimble. Um, and, and I think you'd probably tend to attract and surround oneself with other uh, like-minded individuals who are ready to, to be nimble and, and to you know, work really hard on, uh, on a new area to create something new and, and deliver that to market. So I think that I think that startup environment just really fosters innovation. It's very fun. You can move very quickly. Um, I'd say the challenge, though, is often is resources. Um, you, you often don't have the luxury of uh, so significant resources to invest in you know, your, your, your great ideas. Now, contrast that with, you know, in a large, or, or large organization, Many more resources, many more uh, just you know sort of incredibly experienced uh, business and scientific leaders as partners uh, to to chart a course forward, and you know just incredible R and D resources um, to to build new products that that would be very challenging to to, to build um, in a startup environment. But I, I'd say that the, the the challenge though 
in the in the bigger company environment. Um, to some extent, is the, the required internal bureaucracy to make a large organization run well. Um, so, you, so I think you spend a lot of time, uh, you know, managing internally, uh, and, and maybe a little less time externally focused um, or you know innovation focused. Um, I, I think too, you know, big companies, uh, especially big public companies, have earnings pressures. So, so they need to show earnings growth, you know, year over year, in many cases, quarter over quarter, and and so that 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 often isn't as conducive to taking a, a much longer range view like you can do in a startup. It's okay sometimes in a startup to say, hey, this is gonna take three or five years to materialize because you've got sort of the runway to do that and you don't have the kind of revenue and earnings pressures that um, large public companies do. So it's so a very different environments, both very rewarding for me personally. Um, and I would say I learned very different things in those different environments, but, but now I'm very pleased to be able to bring the best of both to the work we're doing at Strata. Perfect. And it's a great segue uh, to, to my next question. So actually, Dan, if you could explain what Strata is actually doing, what problem are you trying, trying to solve, and uh, how is it going to, to impact cancer diagnostics? Right. So you know, the, the Strata mission is a very simple one. Our mission is to ensure that every patient with cancer uh, is able to receive their best possible treatment. And, and to, to get that treatment as early as possible. Um, unfortunately, that's not the reality today. Uh, there are a number of barriers preventing patients from gaining access to their best possible treatment. And one of those is appropriate testing. And, and this, this, is, this is one area where Strata comes in. So at Strata, we, we deliver uh, a genomic test, uh, actually a series of genomic tests that take a small piece of tumor uh, and profile the DNA and RNA isolated from that tumor to inform on treatment selection. So we identify mutations in the DNA, transcriptional patterns in the RNA, and, and synthesize that data and then deliver a report back to the clinician um, that reads out the molecular profile, but also associates that molecular profile with potential treatments for uh, the patient um, with, uh, with you know, very clear uh, rationale statements behind that, uh, be behind that association. In addition to testing being a barrier to patients getting their best possible treatment, also access to clinical trials is, is a real barrier. You know, and, and this is where there's, there's some disparity depending on where patients are seen. So, so there's you know, wonderful academic medical centers in the U.S., such as Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City, or MD Anderson in Texas uh, that are really you know, thought leading uh, entities that, that, that are participating in uh, all of the latest and, and most advanced clinical trials. For patients being seen elsewhere, um, their molecular profile may suggest that, that, their, that they, uh, their tumor uh, is likely to respond to uh, an investigational medicine uh, in clinical trials or in some cases an off-label medicine. But, but those patients are often not able to access those medicines because the clinical trial isn't locally available or the medicine isn't reimbursed. Um, so this is another area where Strata comes in. So in addition to delivering testing, we also place an equal emphasis on driving forward the clinical research and both partnering with pharmaceutical companies on clinical trials and, and, and making those clinical trials available um, in the community at our health system partners, but also in driving and sponsoring our own therapeutic clinical trials where we believe, um, based on data we've collected, that particular therapies may be efficacious in particular biomarker groups. So it's you know, delivering the testing, but equally important, helping to make the right therapeutics available through clinical trials. Got it. Fantastic. And it's such an important mission. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, there are a, a lot of inputs that we can collect uh, these days about cancer to better stratify those patients and find those matching treatments for them. Um, in terms of technology, what would you say that makes Strata special uh, in terms of information that you can get uh, out of those uh, genomic analysis and how do you analyze it? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. 
Uh, two things make strata testing special and unique. Uh, so one is every tumor that we test in the laboratory, we simultaneously sequence DNA and RNA. And on the RNA side, uh, we do, in my estimation, the best quantification of multiple RNA targets from uh, a limited FFPE tissue sample. And FFPE is formalin fixed paraffin embedded. This is how tumors are stored routinely. So we do quantitative RNA very well. And, and we view this as a critically important complement to DNA mutations. So whereas DNA mutations often tell the story in the case of targeted therapies, so linking mutations to particular targeted therapies that in many cases specifically target the, the, the mutated protein. Um, so, so that's sort of one, one aspect of, of precision oncology. But, it, but an equally important, and I would say increasingly important um, area is ther therapies like immunotherapy, antibody drug conjugates, you know, you know, in addition, CAR-Ts, where quantitative RNA is actually a much more informative uh, a potential biomarker for treatment selection. So I'd say quantitative RNA is, is, is part of our secret sauce. We have shown that our RNA quantification is uh, essentially equivalent to the gold standard quantitative PCR. We've done extensive validation against immunohistochemistry, which is a protein quantification method used routinely in, in the clinic. Um, and, and, and then we've also collected an enormous amount of DNA, quantitative RNA and clinical outcome data so that we're able to correlate DNA and RNA with treatment outcomes and, and learn new multivariate uh, biomarkers. So that, that's sort of one side. The other is a, a very you know, practical um, advantage. Uh, all of the sequencing we do is PCR based. So when, when we target certain regions of the genome or the transcriptome for sequencing, we target those regions with PCR amplification, and we actually simultaneously amplify about 20,000 regions of the genome and transcriptome. By using this PCR method, we're able to start with a minuscule amount of, of tissue, a minuscule amount of input nucleic acid. This allows us to have much more impact in the real world where samples from biopsies or fine needle aspirates are often very, very small. So, so this second sort of differentiator, you know, secret sauce is uh, that the fact that we've been able to optimize PCR, highly multiplex PCR based sequencing um, for, for tumors. Whereas other groups who do a great job sequencing, uh, you know, have a very accurate test that measure many of the same DNA markers that we measure use an alternative technology called hybrid capture. Um, which, which is just a less efficient capture methodology that requires far more, you know, in many cases, prohibitive amounts of tissue and nucleic acid for sequencing. So I'd say those are the two big areas where uh, the testing that we do in the laboratory stands out, uh, which, which helps us you know, deliver more treatment insights, you know, leveraging the RNA, but also for more patients, leveraging this small input advantage that we have. Yeah, sounds fantastic. And I guess in oncology, it's extremely important to get uh, to that high sensitivity of the method, uh, just because of the nature of, of the sample, right? As you mentioned, it's often fixed. You don't know how much tissue uh, oncologists will collect and will be available for analysis. It's really important to, uh, to have that uh, super high sensitivity uh, that you were just describing. That's right. We are doing this show for you, and your feedback is very important for us. So if you have any suggestions or comments, would like us to cover a specific topic or recommend a guest, please write us an email to team at pmedcast.com. Or you can reach out to us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook. Just type in Personalized Medicine Podcast and you will find us there. To download the show notes for this episode, visit our website, pmedcast.com. It's p-m-e-d-c-a-s-t dot com. The show notes include guest bios, links to their most notable work, and recommendations for additional reads on the topic of the episode. Make sure to check them out. And don't miss the next episode. Subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcasting platform. Give us a rating and leave a comment. It will help us make this show better. And now, let's get back to the interview. 
Then uh, I know that uh, Strata recently started a partnership with Pfizer and you launched um, Strata Path Trial. So can you tell us a little bit more about this clinical trial and in general, why pharma companies are interested in partnering with Strata? Yeah, absolutely. So Path, uh, as you said, is a, is a large scale platform clinical trial. And when I say platform clinical trial, I mean, it, it's testing many different therapies across many different biomarker indications across all solid tumor types. PATH stands for Precision Indications for Approved Therapies. So what we're trying to do here is take FDA approved therapies and and find new efficacious uses for these therapies. Um, And what we're doing uh, to devise these new molecular indication hypotheses is we're, le- we're, we're leveraging our real world data that we've collected as well as the latest data and insights from the published literature. So it's our belief that across basically all, nearly all approved cancer therapies, there exist additional patient populations that, that can be identified with a biomarker outside of where those therapies are approved, additional patient populations that have a high likelihood of benefit. And we aim with PATH to really optimize and explore that space connecting biomarkers to therapies and really identify all of those patients who are likely to benefit from the therapies that we have today on the market. We we, we think this this is critically important. We've certainly seen in our data a number of cases where therapies are used off label in a biomarker population, and we have evidence to show that that many of those patients do very, very well. Well, now we wanna demonstrate this prospectively across a range of biomarkers and and, and therapies. Um, What's unique about this is this is the, the, the testing company, Strata, sponsoring the clinical trial that is evaluating the, the, the pharma therapeutics. So, so I, I don't know that uh, a company like ours has ever done a trial like PATH. Usually it's the pharma sponsoring the trial of their drug in their indications of interest. But, but we really see uh, a turning of the tides where companies like Strata, with the data that we're amassing, the clinical outcomes compared with the molecular data, we're in a position to advance these new biomarker hypotheses, which is good for us because uh, it, 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 these trials advance and demonstrate the utility of our tests, uh, but it's also good for pharma and, and, and good for patients to really optimize and maximize the use of the drugs we have. So, so pharma is, is very excited about this model because in the case of PATH, the only thing they need to do is provide us the study drug. We're funding the study, we're driving uh, the site selection and patient enrollment and data collection um, and the pharma is providing study drug. Now, we gladly, um, we're, we're thankful to the pharma for providing the study drug. and We gladly share the data from the study back with the pharma. Our hope and belief is that on success uh, of PATH, one or more arms in PATH, this will both generate the clinical utility data to, to drive these new uses for existing therapies. We'll also provide the ammunition for pharma potentially to go expand the label for uh, their already approved drugs, which is good for the pharma, right? It it drives more prescriptions, more revenues, uh, but most importantly, it's good for the patients uh, who in many cases, you know, based on our biomarker data and the insights we've generated, have the opportunity to be treated with uh, a treatment that that we have, you know, some some degree of confidence um, in in its likelihood of of working. So so it's a very exciting study. We, We really see a future paradigm where you know, pharma goes and gets their, their therapy approved and their lead indication, maybe their second indication. But PATH becomes a platform for pharma to insert these new improved therapies, for strata to use our data, our real-world evidence, our biomarkers to devise new hypotheses, and then go test those prospectively. This is, this is a very exciting prospect to clinicians uh, and to patients, especially those patients with you know, advanced metastatic cancer um, and, and who have exhausted, you know, standard treatment options. So, so as, as, as you and, and, and your listeners well know, metastatic cancer is often a, a death sentence. So, so the opportunity to be treated with a precision-matched therapy 
um, is, is just incredible. Uh, you know, it provides hope uh, to patients and, and it provides new treatments to evaluate uh, to, to clinicians and, and researchers. So, so we're very excited about this initiative. Um, we're, we're thrilled that Pfizer uh, joined in as our first pharma partner. That Pfizer was um, you know, intrigued by our science and, and, and committed um, for, uh, study drugs for four arms. Um, and we're currently in discussions with, with probably a half a dozen pharma uh, about uh, providing study drug uh, for additional arms. Uh, and so we, we really see this as a, a, key, a key trial, a, a key platform to advance uh, precision oncology um, with the drugs we have today. Yeah, fantastic. And it sounds really like a revolutionary model in terms of uh, what you just said, uh, that Strata itself is is a sponsor of this study, which is very unusual uh, for, for the field of genomics uh, in general so far. What I also would like to discuss with you is essentially the business models in the space of, of um, uh, genomics and oncology, because there are a lot of exciting companies kind of trying to attack this problem of uh, precision therapeutics from different angles. And uh, many of, of them kind of bet on the reimbursement. Uh, some of them are trying to, to uh, get uh, more extensive partnerships with pharma, kind of provide a data bank of, of genomics data that pharma can uh, run uh, virtual trials on. What is your take kind of on the future of business models in the space? And uh, if it is not a commercial secret, kind of where Strata is positioning itself on this map? Yeah, very, fair question. I think, you know, very simply, uh, reimbursed testing is, in my estimation, the largest market opportunity for a company like Strata. Um, you know, there, there are opportunities on the sort of data aggregation and licensing front. That this actually takes me back to my prior company, Compendia, that, that, that was our business model, sort of licensing data to pharma. I, I think there are opportunities there, but I think... Um, they're they're not as large as the opportunity of you know delivering testing to you know hundreds of thousands of patients in the U.S. potentially millions of patients uh, globally to delivering reimbursed testing. Um, so we're very much focused on on that as our primary uh, revenue driver. Um, although we 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 have a, a pharma business, we provide services to pharma companies, but I view that as much as a catalyst for our testing business as I do a revenue revenue generator in and of itself. Understood. Perfect. It makes perfect sense. And um, in terms of reimbursement, so I guess US is leading the world uh, in terms of um, reimbursing those precision oncology tests. I think Europe and here in Germany, we are still lagging a little bit behind. Have you seen a lot of shifts in the last five years on the side of US payers? And do you expect that more and more tasks, more complex panels will get reimbursed in, in the United States soon? Yeah, great, great question. So, so there has been a, 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 a large transformation in the US. Um, you know, I'd say five, maybe six years ago, there was very limited reimbursement, but now uh, Medicare, which is uh, healthcare for the elderly, government healthcare for the elderly in the US for, for individuals 65 years and older, um, covers NGS testing. Um, and, and so this has been really transformative for, for the industry and for companies like Strata. Um, and, and the reason is, you know, about half of patients with advanced cancer are 65 and older. So, you know, our testing is covered for about half of the population. Now, private payers, so, so in the United States, patients under 65 um, generally have a private health insurance, um, you know, em employer funded private health insurance. Uh, the, the, the payer landscape is, is much more fragmented um, on the private payer side with some private payers covering NGS, um, some not covering NGS at all, and some somewhere in the middle, you know, covering only for specific tumor types like non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, but, but I see the trend as moving towards universal coverage for NGS in the United States. You really, in my view, with the drugs that we have approved here, including now a number of uh, drugs approved pan-solid tumor in biomarker indications with biomarkers that can only be ascertained from NGS, you, you really can't rationalize um, not testing and, and not paying for uh, testing 
if, if you're you know, trying to deliver the, the best care possible to patients. Uh, you know, I think some docs w uh, and payers will make the argument that in many tumor types, the yield is low. So the proportion of patients that I'm uh, you know, treating differently based on an NGS result is low. And that's true um, in some, some tumor types. Our, our work with quantitative RNA linking into immunotherapy and ADC seeks to change that. But today, um, the, the, the yield uh, in some tumor types is low. The counter argument that I would make though is even though in those tumor types where the yield is low, for the patients who are biomarker positive and have a precision treatment opportunity, say with an NTRAC inhibitor like lerotractinib, um, the, uh, the impact for that patient is enormous, right? Um, NTRAC inhibitors, for example, have you know, incredibly high objective response rates. Many patients have complete responses and long-term durable responses. So uh, my view is every patient deserves to have an NGS test. Uh, and, and, and to see if, if they are likely to benefit from an approved therapy or potentially an investigational therapy in clinical trials. And this really needs to be the standard of care. And I, and I think the payer landscape is shifting in the, that direction. I would suspect that same shift will happen um, you know, in, in, in Europe uh, and, and elsewhere um, as, as we look out you know, five years, 10 years um, from now. It, it's really just inevitable based on uh, the, the treatments uh, that that we have today and the treatments that are coming down the pipeline. Perfect. Yeah, sounds exciting, and and let's let's really hope for that. And I think the last five years really uh, taught us a lot that it is possible and can be done, and uh, the benefits are clear. So um, let's hope that um, NGS will be adopted worldwide uh, as a, as a diagnostic tool for for cancer patients. I agree. Perfect. And Dan, just one more uh, question. Um, on the preventive screening. So um, obviously there is a lot of talk uh, in, uh, in the field of oncology now about um, general kind of regular uh, checkups, either based on liquid biopsy or, or other types of samples, just to check um, perhaps a slightly older population uh, if they have any cancer marker, markers that can be detected. And what do you think about that? Um, how far we are in, in this technology uh, so far and uh, do you believe that this is also something that can be reimbursed potentially in the future? Yeah, great question. So, so first of all, the, the companies working in the space have done phenomenal work. The technology is amazing. The ability to um, detect cancer from the blood in asymptomatic populations, you know, using multiple, in, in some cases, multiple sort of omic methodologies, um, you know, it, it is incredible. I, I, think, I think the question that remains, though, is sort of practical clinical utility. Um, you know, screening an asymptomatic population um, means that if you are anything less than perfect in specificity, you're going to be turning up a lot of false positives, right? A lot of patients uh, who don't have cancer but, uh, but, but scored positive uh, on one of these tests. And so how, how as a society uh, do, we, do we deal with that? And I, th I think the way to answer that question is to look at past precedents with asymptomatic cancer screening. For example, PSA screening, mammograms, colonoscopies as, as three examples. Um, and, and when I look at those and think critically about the, 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 the challenges that they've had, you know, take PSA screening, for example. PSA screening absolutely finds more prostate cancer and finds it earlier. But, but that's, that's not the question that we need to answer. The question is, does finding those additional prostate cancers earlier lead to better outcomes for, for, for those men? And, and that's where, where the data for PSA screening um, is, I, I would say the, you know, the, the, the jury's out, that there might be a, a, a very slight mortality advantage uh, to uh, PSA screening, but very slight. And you have to counter that with all of the unnecessary uh, morbidity that, that uh, results from that screening, all of, the, uh, all of the negative biopsies, all of the angst and worry uh, among men and, and their families. Uh, and, and that same story really plays out um, with mammograms. Um, you can certainly, the data shows, you can certainly find breast cancers earlier with mammograms. But again, the, the real question is, is that 
improving women's lives. Um, and, and so, you know, if you look across different countries and different, uh, d d different professional societies, the recommendations on PSA and mammograms vary quite widely. Um, and, and so I, I think that's just a lesson um, for us to say, screening is a hard problem. You know, you can have a very good test that can find cancer, can be an accurate cancer detector. But, but doing asymptomatic screening needs, it means it needs to be better than, you know, uh, high accuracy. It needs to be near perfect on the specificity side. So I think that's the challenge that, um, you know, the, these asymptomatic screening companies have. I'm, I'd say I'm, um, I'd, I'd say I'm, I'm, I'm moderately optimistic that, that these technologies can deliver. But, but I would say I'm, I'm still concerned that, you know, it may just not be biologically possible, given the samples we're studying, to have that perfect specificity required for a practical application. So I, I think these companies have their work cut out for them. Many of them are running very large scale clinical trials that will address these questions. And, and, and I'm uh, sort of uh, awaiting outcomes from those studies eagerly. This is not an area that Strata's working, Strata's focused uh, after on, on patients after a diagnosis. We are, we are delivering uh, an MRD test, a minimal residual disease test using liquid biopsy, but this is only for patients who have a known diagnosis of cancer, have had surgery to remove that cancer, and then we're monitoring their blood to look for residual or recurrent disease. Perfect. Yeah, it's a very interesting take on that, and I completely agree with you on the PSA example. If I'm not wrong, it's one of the um, most common uh, examples in in the biomarker research where the the rate of false positives is just uh, over the top because there are like so many other factors that can uh, drive the PSA levels uh, high, other than the prostate cancer, for example. Yeah, that, that, that's right. Yeah, so that would, that would be the example where it's more challenging. I think colonoscopies are, are, the, are the positive example where screening you know, very definitively saves lives. I think the question, though, is, is that because we're doing the screening or is that because part of the screening is actually you know, surgical removal of polyps, which are cancer precursors? So it'll be really interesting to see how, uh, how this shakes out. I, I certainly uh, you know, subscribe to the belief that you know, if we can treat patients earlier in their disease burden, um, we're, we're likely to have better outcomes. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a supporter and, and, and hopeful that, that, these, that these trials will pan out and, and we'll have a new tool to find cancer earlier. Great. Perfect. And then kind of speaking of the future, uh, which three major developments do you see happening in the field of precision oncology over the next, let's say, five to 10 years? Yeah, well, so let, let, let me, I'll give you two um, that, that, that we're very bullish on, and, and I'll, I'll see if a third comes to me. But the, the, the two I would say are, one I've already alluded to is quantitative RNA. So, you know, DNA mutation sequencing it has, in the U.S. at least, is really becoming mainstay for advanced cancer care. Um, I see quantitative RNA uh, as an equally important molecule and, and an equally sort of informative biomarker for other classes of therapies. So, so I see you know, simultaneous DNA and RNA sequencing as, as a new standard of care in, in, in five years so that a clinician and a patient can profile a tumor and, and then very quickly uh, surmise, you know, is this patient a candidate for targeted therapy, for immunotherapy, for an antibody drug conjugate, all with one, you know, one small biopsy sample, one single testing platform. So that's one. I think an equally exciting uh, uh, trend that's emerging is, is this MRD testing, uh, minimal residual disease testing. And here's why. So today, for early stage cancer patients, uh, surgery is the mainstay treatment, right? So tumors are surgically removed. And then those patients are in, in sort of a, a challenging uh, situation in which they may have been cured by surgery. That surgery may have gotten all the cancer or that cancer may have begun to spread before the surgery, and there may be what's called micrometastatic disease, not detectable by radiography, but, 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 but present in, in that patient's body. And so then the patient really is sort of left in this kind of nervous, you know, sort of anxiety-provoking uh, few years where they're getting scans, 
uh, to say, hey, are, is there any signs of uh, disease um, in, in my body? And, and every year that passes uh, with a negative scan, uh, the, the patient can begin to uh, be more and more confident that, that they were cured by that surgery. But, but a good proportion of patients do recur and, and develop advanced metastatic disease. So in the future, with liquid biopsy-based MRD testing or minimal residual disease or, or recurrent disease, um, what, what we're able to do is look for signs of circulating tumor DNA in a patient's blood to find those, th those patients who have micrometastatic disease, who are really are destined to recur, to find those patients much earlier so that we can treat them with their optimal precision therapy before they develop you know, overt or widespread metastatic disease. I think this is really going to transform early stage cancer care. At Strata, we're launching a, a large study called Sentinel um, here um, in, in the next few months where we're testing early stage patients' tumors with our DNA and RNA sequencing assay, but then we're testing their blood sequentially you know, every couple of months thereafter uh, to look for signs of circulating tumor DNA. And then through Sentinel, those patients can access pharma treatments, um, the biomarker match pharma treatments, and, and we'll be studying, um, uh, asking, our, asking the question, does treating early based on circulating tumor DNA lead to improved patient outcomes? Uh, and and I'm, I'm bullish on this study, and I, th I think this, this study and, and work of other you know, great companies in the space um, will lead to a big-time paradigm shift for early-stage cancer care, really bringing precision medicine from, from the late stage where it exists today into the early stage where there are many more patients, and I think it has the potential to be much more impactful. Absolutely. That that sounds fantastic and sounds like a great future, and uh, I know you just said two uh Two predictions for the future, but though they are so impactful that we'll count them as three. So certainly, right. especially on on MRD, uh, MRD testing, I think that's that's really important. What you said um, in terms of being able to monitor those cancer patients and see if there if there are any recurring events, uh, and then in in such cases, just to make sure that that those patients get um, follow up treatment, precision follow up treatment as soon as possible. That's the key. That's the key because today, those precision treatments that we use in the late stage, um, most of them are not approved in the early stage. So, so you really can't get access to the precision medicine until you have you know, sort of widespread metastatic disease. So, so, so that really needs to change. Yeah, absolutely. Great. And then one last question. Um, I know there are a lot of young scientists uh, who are listening to this podcast, and uh, a lot of them are thinking also about venturing into starting their own company, uh, perhaps in the bioinformatics, in genomic space. Which one advice would you give to, to those people, to those young scientists who aspire to start uh, their company in the biotech diagnostics or uh, precision medicine space? Yeah, great question. You know, the advice I often give students is, you know, when, when you're you know, a graduate student or a postdoc, you have this incredible opportunity to spend all of your time uh, on, on one specific area. So, so my advice is use that time wisely. Become uh, a, a true world expert in, in, in some you know, sliver of, of the domain. Be, become you know, the, the, the most knowledgeable, the most expert um, in, in one area. And read everything papers, supplementary materials, read everything that, that the, the, the thought leaders are, are publishing and, and, and be right there at the cusp and able to sort of take the, the, those next leaps with, with, your own, uh, with your own critical thinking. So I, I think that's one piece of advice. Too often I see students sort of kind of sitting back and waiting for their, their, their mentor to kind of direct them to their next project or, or, or their next task. And I think that's, that, that's not the right mindset if, if you aspire to really lead change in the future. So I, I'd say use the time, go super deep, become an expert um, in, in some area. That's one. And then two is always in the back of your mind, be thinking about the practical clinical application of your work. And, 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 if, and if your view is there is none... Um, the, the, and it's and it's really just you know the, the most basic science, which is important too. Um, uh, th then I think you need, need to recognize that you're really pursuing more of a basic science route. But but if but if you aspire 
to build a business or be an entrepreneur, you, you really need to, to find and see that practical application. And, and on that front, I would say connect with the world leaders in, in that practical application. Um, you know, go, go to that top oncologist or that top scientist, share the work that you're doing, talk to them about your belief of the practical application and, and get their feedback. Don't, don't, don't operate in a vacuum. Really take advantage of uh, the thought leaders that, that exist in the world. My experience has been that the majority of uh, the, the thought leaders uh, in the world um, love to spend time with eager you know, with eager students or young professionals who are charting their course. So, so go deep and, and, and reach out to, to the, the very best people to, to give you feedback and, and, and critique your, uh, your, your, your thoughts and your work. Perfect, Dan. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think this, uh, this advice is really pure gold. And uh, I only second that um, kind of becoming a really deep domain expertise is uh, ex expert in your field is uh, incredibly important if you really want want to cause change and, and on your second point uh, I also completely agree like just networking and making sure that that you you talk to the best people in the field to the best best experts um, get their ideas and perspective uh, and their feedback even if it is brutal uh, is very important uh, just to make sure That's right. that that your idea is going good direction you got it. Perfect. Then, and just before I let you go, um, one last, very last question. Um, where our audience can find you online in case they want to reach out? Yeah, sure. I think the easiest is on LinkedIn. So uh, I'm a, a frequent LinkedIn user and uh, you, know, you, can, you can connect with me there and, and shoot me a message on LinkedIn. Perfect. Dan, fantastic. Thank you so much for doing this interview. Uh, I really love to, to learn more about Strata, your approach. Uh, you guys are doing really a lot of stuff for the first time. Uh, the past trial uh, sounds amazing. So good luck to all of your endeavors, to the entire Strata team. And um, I hope to have you on the podcast again in a short time. Oh, that'd be great. Well, th thank you for the, for the time and the discussion today. And, and, and thank you to all the listeners. Have a great day. Perfect. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much for being with us today on the Personalized Medicine Podcast. If you like this show and know someone who would enjoy it too, please share this podcast with them. And don't miss the next episode yourself. Subscribe to the Personalized Medicine Podcast on your favorite podcasting app. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and many, many more. Please rate us there and leave a comment. That helps us to grow and deliver the best experience to you. To access the show notes for this episode, visit our website, pmedcast.com. It's p-m-e-d-c-a-s-t.com. And engage with us on social media, where we regularly share the news and exciting content on personalized medicine. You can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook just by typing in Personalized Medicine Podcast. Or use our handle, pmedcast. And if you have any feedback or would like to suggest a guest for the show, write us an email to team at pmedcast.com. Have a great day and until next time.